It is. This will be your last Halloween of senior year. Enjoy. Okay, so let's talk about this. And for the sake of time, because I do want to make sure, shh, okay. I do want to make sure that we have time to talk about your last test, which is like two weeks ago, um, as well as the, uh, the free response quiz. I told you we will have a free response quiz on, I did tell you Monday, right? Because Herman came in thinking it was today, and I was like, there's no quiz today. Yeah. It's a soft G, right, isn't it? What, what are some other words that have the G is pronounced to like an H? I know they exist. Don't they? I mean, I'm sure they exist. Is that more about them? Or are they not? Hieronimo. Right? Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Is it a Spanish thing? Right. I'll find I'll find one. Okay. Uh, so we were talking about number ten, and I do remember talking about this very briefly. But one over x, one over x, you need to recognize as the derivative of natural log x. So that's just recognition. There's no process for that. If you tried to power rule that, and I'm, not, and I'm using the power rule to refer to antiderivatives as well. So the antiderivative power rule, if you added one, you would get zero, which nothing wrong with x to the zero, but you are also supposed to divide by the new exponent. And at that point, you're killing kittens, right? So, so do not do the power rule for 1 over x. You just know that that's natural log. But I'm not going to do that yet because I have some cleaning up to do with this guy. I, I prefer to use STDs. So I'll make that x squared over x to the fifth, which is 1 over x cubed, plus 3 over x to the fifth. And then for those two, you will bring the x's up to the top, um, but not the 1 over x. I'm still going to leave the 1 over x. This will be x to the negative 3 plus 3x to the negative 5. And now we are ready to find the antiderivative. The antiderivative of 1 over x is ln x. The antiderivative of x to the negative 3 would be x to the negative 2 over negative 2. Remember, you were adding and then dividing by the new exponent. The 3, I'm just going to ignore. It will come along for the ride. Negative 5 plus 1 is negative 4. And we'll divide by negative 4. And don't forget a plus c. For now, I am okay if you stop there. Just like with derivatives, in the future, we will use antiderivatives to answer bigger questions. And in those cases, it may behoove you to move those negative exponents back to the denominator. But for now, but for now, let's, let's get good at the mechanics of antiderivatives, and then we'll deal with the simplifying of them later. Is that okay? Any questions about 10? Because I'm about to correct it. There's a mistake. A mistake that you may not know of, does anybody know where the mistake is? Oh, I, I mean, I it's not necessarily parentheses, although I do kind of like putting parentheses there to, make, to ensure that nobody thinks that the other things are inside the log, but um, I don't think that's necessary. So the mistake, the mistake is that the ln x is not the true antiderivative of 1 over x. The reason is this. Think about... Think about the function 1 over x. What is the domain of 1 over x? Domain is everything except 0. So that would be negative infinity to 0 and then 0 to infinity. If that's the domain of your original problem, that antiderivative should have the same domain. So when I say the antiderivative is natural log of x, and I'm going to ignore the plus c for a little bit, I'm ignoring half of the original problem. The domain is only 0 to infinity, right? And so, so if we have to use this antiderivative for things in the negative side that do work for the derivative, we have an issue. So we have to fix that. We have to fix that. And it's a very simple fix. What can I do to this to correct the domain? Yep, we put absolute values around the x. With those absolute values, I am now allowed to plug in negatives and the domain of the antiderivative is the same as the domain of the original. So you want to make sure you preserve that domain. So just know, anytime you do antiderivatives and you have an, an a, a, blah, 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 you have a natural log as part of the antiderivative, put it in absolute values. Put it in absolute values. There we go. I like to make my natural absolute values big. Good, good. 
All right, 11, in my opinion, is the easiest one on the page. Why? It's just recognition. Just recognition. You should recognize that as the derivative of arc cosine x. There is no process for that. You just know it, hopefully. Or, oh, thank you. Forgot the plus c. 48. Or, f could be what? There's a second option. What if you ignore the negative? Because the negative is like a constant. What would the antiderivative of 1 over root 1 minus x squared be? Arc sine. So we could say or negative arc sine. Uh, or, or you could write it with sine negative 1 uh, notation. Same thing. Yep. Uh, does not matter which one of those two you go with if it's free response. But if it's multiple choice, you need to be able to realize that they're both options. They obviously will not give you both of those. Uh, I also like 12. 12, in my opinion, might be the second easiest. What is 12? You should be able to just look at it and write down the answer. Yeah. I consider this recognition. Some teachers would disagree with me. I consider this recognition because you are supposed to know that the derivative of natural log of anything is a fraction where the argument goes in the denominator and its derivative goes in the numerator. So in antiderivatives, we go from right to left. So if I have a fraction and I'm doing antiderivatives, the very first thing I look for is whether the top is the derivative of the bottom. If the top is the derivative of the bottom, then I recognize that as the derivative of natural log. Good? Good, and I consider that recognition. It technically falls under uh, an integration, te an antiderivative technique called uh, u-substitution, which is the process we use to undo the chain rule. And we will learn u-substitution uh, sometime before, probably before uh, December. Um, but this is one that I almost consider recognition. Good, bad, ugly? Yes, yes, yes. What if? Actually, you know, I'll just make up a new problem. What if I told you that the derivative is, uh, let's do something similar. Let's just say 2x over x squared plus 9. What would f of x be? OK, top is derivative of the bottom, natural log of x squared plus 9. Are we OK with that? Why not? I didn't put absolute values. Thank you. Who said that? I was waiting for it. Uh, x squared plus 9. The purpose of absolute values is to avoid the possibility that the argument is negative. x squared plus 9 cannot be negative, right? So. You don't need to, like, you, on multiple choice, sometimes they'll leave off the absolute values if it's not necessary. It's never wrong to put them, though. So even though it's not necessary in this case, I still, out of habit, would do absolute value x squared plus 9. Um, but if you're doing a multiple choice problem and you realize that they're not in absolute values, it's probably because the argument cannot be negative anyway. So just something to look out for in multiple choice. For your spots, I would just stick with absolute values out of habit. Good, bad, ugly? All right. On the other side, you had these problems, and I'm not going to do all of them. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to do any of the first eight. Uh, number four, by the way, you do not know how to do the product rule backwards. We are going to learn that at some point. But since we don't know that yet, for four, distribute the square root of x. You will add exponents and turn it into a power rule. So I'm not going to go over it in detail, but I did want to point that out. Uh, five, you're also going to have to do algebra. You're going to have to do STDs. Um, ooh, I want to do seven. I said I'm not going to do any of these. What about seven? Seven should be easy, but it's also very easy to mess this up. Secant squared x. What is that? Oh, I also changed the notation. This is a notation that bugs me. But in calculus, if you see a little f and a capital F in the same problem, it is understood that little f is the derivative and capital F is the antiderivative. Okay, that's just that's just how they do it. Um, 
the only way I can kind of make sense of that, like if we're doing derivatives, it's really easy. Like if f of x equals something and I say f prime, that's our notation for doing the derivative. But if I want to do the antiderivative, we can't like put the prime on the other side, right? Maybe just move it over, right? So what we do for antiderivatives, I kind of think of it as you're making the problem bigger, right? In the world of polynomials, derivatives make your polynomials smaller. So if you do an antiderivative, it makes it bigger. And so we'll say it bigifies the function and turns it into a capital F for the antiderivative. So uh, just a little notation thing. If you ever see little f and cap f or little g and cap g or something like that, it's understood that capital G is the original, the little one is the derivative. So capital F on this one, secant squared, you should recognize as the derivative of tangent x. Sine x is the derivative of? Ah, is negative cosine, not positive. That is the easiest place to make a SIGIN error, right? SIGIN, so we don't confuse it with sine, right? So it's the easiest place to make a sine error, positive negative error. And I will still, to this day, I've been doing calculus, what is this, like my 18th year teaching calculus, I think, I still, when I do the antiderivatives of sine and cosine, I still check my answer in my head very quickly. If I wrote positive cosine, I would quickly change it because in my mind, I'm thinking the derivative of cosine is negative sine. That's not what I started with. So I would, I always still double check those. Anytime I do the antiderivative of sine or cosine, I will check to make sure that I wrote the right thing down because it only takes a hot second. Good, 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 good. Uh, and then let's do, uh, let's do nine. And then I'm going to abandon ship on this sheet for the purpose of making sure we have time to go over the test and talking about the free response quiz coming up on Monday. So I gave you the velocity. I told you that S of one, S being the position, I probably should have formally declared S the position, but it's kind of understood. I told you that the position at one is six. I want you to find the position at three. What do you think we should do? Gonna have to do the antiderivative. We have velocity, we need position. So my position function would be t cubed plus 2t plus a c. And if you forgot the plus c, you will miss this. What do I do next? Good. This is called an initial condition. That is called an initial condition. Don't assume that initial must be t equals 0. An initial condition just means they give you some ordered pair that satisfies the original function, that allows you to solve for C. Use that to find C. So my position at one is one cubed plus two times one plus C, and that should return six, and that means C is three. So now I can reset my position function, and I have a complete position function of that, and I can plug in three to get my position at time three. So three cubed plus two times three plus three. That's a lot of threes. Uh, what's that, 36? So we get 36. Are we good? Bad? Ugly? Cool. So let's see. Let me pause recording while I get my bearings here. And here we are. So let's talk about this free response question. We have about 10 minutes, not even. We have eight minutes. Um, and because of the amount of time we have left, we're probably not going to go hardcore on all of these. We won't have time. But let's see what all we can do. All right. Shh. We're chatty today. Okay, so a lot of information here. It says, for part A, estimate the radius of the balloon when t is 5.4 using the tangent line approximation. This is a linear approximation question. So I will need a point and a slope. So my radius, I need my radius at five. I need the slope of the radius at five, r prime, the slope of the radius. Now that sounds weird. Uh, r of five, it's not in the table, but in the paragraph somewhere, I need to go look at this. Here, the radius of the balloon is 30 feet when, R is, when T is 5. 
So right there they tell you that r of 5 is equal to 30. r prime of 5 is in the table, that's 2. And so my tangent line would be y minus 30 equals 2 x minus 5. Technically it should be r minus 30 equals 2 t minus 5. I'm, I'm not going to split hairs over that. And then my radius at 5.4 would be approximately 2 times 5.4 minus 5 plus 30, which is 30.8. Yeah, if you choose to clean that up. Now, if you don't trust your arithmetic, don't do that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. You don't have to clean it up. Now, if, they, if you had to interpret the answer or something like that, then having a cleaned up answer would be good. But there's my approximation. That would be in meters, feet. Okay? Now, would that be above or below the actual value? Why? The graph is concave down. We use concavity. Right here, they tell you that R is concave down. And if you have a concave down function, the tangent line that you are using for approximations will lie above the curve. Right? So this is an overestimate because R is concave down. You do not have to justify the concavity because it is explicitly given to you in the paragraph. Good, good? Good, good. All right, number B. Um, I think I'm just going to talk about this one. Find the rate of change of the radius of the balloon with respect to time. Oh, never mind. We are going to do this one in detail. Sorry, 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 sorry. All right, this one is asking you to find dr dt, find dr dt when t is equal to 5. Oh, you're right, volume, son of a, 50. Man, I'm going to be at my mom's birth year before we're done today. That's 52. i got to hurry up and make some mistakes. All right. Uh, we're finding dv dt when t is 5, and when t is 5, we already know that r is 30, and dr dt, r prime, is 2, and I'm doing that from memory off the table, right? And you are given the formula for volume. Volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. That's given to you when we do the derivative. dv dt is, bring the 3 down, 3 times 4 thirds is 4, pi r squared. Does that look familiar? What is that? That's a formula for surface area. Don't forget the dr dt, though. There is a very specific reason that the derivative of volume brings you to surface area. Similarly, if you do the derivative of area, it takes you to perimeter of two-dimensional shapes. So we'll, we may talk about that reason later. Um, now I just plug in everything I know. We know that R is 30. That's a jacked up 4. Let me fix that. 4, my pi looks dumb too. 4 pi 30 squared, dr is 2. I would stop there. If you look at my answers that I posted, I did clean it up just in case you were curious what the answers are. I would stop there. I would put my units. We found dv, which is v cubed over time. What, what, what is our units of time? Huh? Minutes. Okay. 30-foot radius. That is a big balloon. Um, C. Do I need to go back to that one? All right. Okay, C. Look at C. Estimate R double prime. It was 6, wasn't it? We're estimating R double prime of 6. Let me put my head back over here. R double prime of 6. I need to go back and copy the table, and then interpret the meaning in the context of the problem. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. All right, so let's talk about this one. If I want our double prime of 6, the first daunting task is to find out where 6 falls on the table. I believe that is between 5 and 7. And so we will, if I want our double prime, that's the slope of our prime. So our double prime of 6 Remember, you must include a difference quotient. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip to this. Usually, I would write r prime of 7 minus r prime of 5. I'm jumping straight to this. 
that turns into negative 0.8 over 2. Is that right? Is that negative 0.4? I think so. You don't have to clean it up. Negative 0.4. What would units be? In the numerator, I subtracted feet per minute. And in the denominator, I subtracted minutes. So it's feet per minute per minute. Or you could say feet per minute squared. It's like an acceleration measure. And interpret that. So now my interpretation I'm going to do quickly. We found out that our double prime was negative. I'm still not going to tie it to concavity. That's confusing. The derivative of r prime is negative. That means that r prime is decreasing, and that's how I'm going to explain this. I'm going to put in words what r prime is, and r prime is the rate of change of the radius. Right? And, and if you want to go ahead and leave, you can, because I know the bell just rang. You may have another class to go to. I'm going to finish this, though. The rate of change of the radius is decreasing. at approximately the rate, and I'm going to put the word approximately to satisfy the gods, but I don't think you really have to worry about that, at approximately the rate of 0 0.4 feet per minute squared at time t equals 6 minutes. I would encourage you to look at the, both of these free response questions. I'll uh, answer questions on them on Monday before the quiz. We'll have a 15-minute quiz, and after that, we'll go hardcore review for the test. Mm -hmm. Yes, the one you see Monday will be similar to these two.